Um, Mises, Mises, I had the great privilege of studying under him. He was a, a magnificent person, both in his uh, mental achievements as, and, and in his personality. And uh, I want to talk about both today. The um, Mises started off uh, in the great grand old days of world pre World War One Vienna, the last great civilized uh, whatever uh, that's been seen, I think. And uh, one of the great things about him. By the way, first name was he was full of anecdotes of the old days and what happened and who said what to who and it was just charming. Um, the uh, he had a uh, he grew up and he started in, in the University of Vienna and the seminar of the great von Bawerk, one of the, the masters of the Austrian school of economics, uh, and uh, he was one of the shining stars in the seminar and uh, became quite radical in it because he came to the conclusion that you can apply uh, subjective value theory and margin utility theory, not just to the so-called microsphere, terrible word, but I'm sort of stuck with it, not just to the microsphere of individual actions in the market and prices and, and production, which of course is very important, but also to the sphere of money, which had, had for a long time been totally separated. Um, it was really in 19th century English economics, or British economics, that we started this big separation between the microsphere over there and the macro over there. The macro you deal with money and gross national product and all that stuff. And uh, of course in standard economics there's no connection between micro and macro. You take a micro course and you learn about how more or less how good the market is with you know, a lot of exceptions. Um, and, uh, and supply and demand clears the price system and so forth and so on. It works pretty well. I mean, generally conceded. It works pretty, the market works pretty well. And in the micro area and you get, a, you get a point where, for example, within the Communist Party, not in the United States, but places where they're really doing things, like you know, Hungary or something, uh, as the economists in the Communist Party were much better, much more free market oriented than everybody else. I mean, it's that sort of shift. At any rate, um, but the macro sphere is supposed to be is considered, is talked about totally separately. Uh, when you get to the macro sphere, they talk about the velocity of circulation and things like that, gross national product, growth rates. Seemingly with no connection with what was going on in the, in the you know in the micro course where the individual and the inter interrelations between individuals were, were dealt with, so Mises is the first one, at least since early 18th century Catalan uh, in France, to uh, to integrate to, real, to believe that they can be integrated and started doing it. And so his first great work, Theory of Money and Credit, came out in 1912, uh, takes the subject of value theory, the margin utility theory, and applies it to the Sphere of money and you know, general price level, general prices. Uh, it was not accepted by, even by his fellow Austrians. They thought this was going too far, you can't do it, too radical, etc., etc. Um, uh, and so, which he started doing, just by example, first by example, and secondly by his own private seminar. Interestingly enough, I'll get back to this a little later too. Uh, Mises never in his whole life had a paid university position. Uh, he was certainly qualified <laughs> for it, <laughs> say the least. I'll get back to his, his American experience a little later on. But um, even in Vienna, he lost out. There was only one professor, I think, in Vienna, uh, one paid professor. He lost out on this to somebody who was a more orthodox <laughs> type who did not integrate it with the money, money supply, uh, the theory of money. and. Um, so he had his private seminar. He worked for the cha Chamber of Commerce, uh, which in, the, in, in Vienna, and did a lot of a lot of a lot of work, which has been lost of policy studies and things like that, and advice to the Austrian government. He was the one, by the way, apparently who stopped the Austrian inflation from becoming really run runaway. This was in the early 1920s. It was a very severe inflation, something like Argentina now. It never got to the hyper runaway stage, but Mises almost single-handed prevail on the government to stop it. Uh, so he was always an activist as well as a, as a theoretician. Uh, and he, um, but he, he had his private seminar in, in, in Europe in those days, maybe still, I don't know. Uh, you can be at a university unpaid and have a private seminar. Uh, and uh, it was considered quite, quite prestigious. It was not like, you know, not like here, you sort of you have an alternative university or something. You, you rent a room in the university. It was, it was a prestigious post, except it was unpaid. So, of course, which is important. <laughs> and, uh, and it was in that private seminar where people flocked all through, all from, from all over Europe, uh, including England, to study under him because the, the, the reputation became enormous. His reputation became enormous. So, first thing he did was integrate 
uh, subject of value theory and Austrian economics in general into the money sphere. And then by the end of his book, he really starts applying it to business cycles. Uh, he was the first great business cycle theorist because uh, the, the phenomenon of business cycles had been discovered for a long time and analyzed and so forth. Nobody could, nobody could quite figure it out because if the market tends toward equilibrium, tends toward uh, situation of full employment and everything clears and so forth and so on, how come there's always business cycle? How come there's booms, several years of booms always succeeded by several years of bust? And so there are, all, there are all sorts of wild theories. For example, Stanley Jevons, who was quite good economist in his own right, had a sunspot theory. He believed that uh, <laughs> as the sun you know, changes or whatever, this causes the problems in the wheat crop. This somehow causes the business cycle. So a lot of nutty theories came, came up because they couldn't figure out anything else. So, uh, so Mises, first of all, realized that it can't be a market phenomenon because the market, everything is you know, tending toward, toward the clarity and people learn from their experience and so forth and so on. Uh, and he began to realize it's really the intervention by the central bank and the money sphere that causes, generates business cycles. And he works out the outlines of it, this theory of money and credit. From then on, he starts uh, developing that. During the 1920s, he develops a whole uh, elaborate, more elaborate theory about how business cycles are caused by government intervention of the banking system, generating inflation through the, through the central bank, and thereby causing malinvestment, or causing unsound investments, which the recession has to liquidate. See, the, the result is that um, the recession, even though, of course, pain in the neck, becomes an inevitable and necessary conclusion to a boom. In other words, once you start the boom process, the inflationary boom, which causes unsound investments, they have to be liquidated. So the recession process becomes the adjustment process. It's the method by which the market reasserts itself, the free market reasserts itself. So that you wind up after the recovery with an efficient system uh, benefiting the consumers in the best possible way. Uh, as a result, the way to stop a business cycle, both the recession and the boom, is to, is to stop the central bank from generating inflation, from expanding credit. The way to do that, of course, is to abolish the central bank. I mean, it's the easiest way to do it, <laughs> or the simplest way, I'd say, not politically easy. Uh, short of, of abolishing the central bank, you put you chain it down, forbid it from doing anything, that sort of thing. Uh, so early in the game, then, Mises really re reconstituted the approach of the money supply becomes a key factor, both in inflation and in business cycles, almost, almost single-handed. The um, Unfortunately, the, uh, in, in the scholarly world, and this is still true, by the way, nobody reads a foreign language. Okay? We all pass, to get this PhD, even now you have to pass a language test. I think two languages, at least one. That's true, we all pass it, and it's all fake. I mean, uh, <laughs> nobody knows a damn thing. <laughs> it's the sort of thing where, first of all, they allow you to have a dictionary. Okay? And so if you, if you study German, let's say, for a couple of months, you can, you can sort of parcel it out. And uh, you can flunk it. I know somebody who flunked this French test about three times before they finally passed it. And obviously, you, you forget it the next day. And once you pass it, you say, whew, that's over with. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so uh, as a result, nobody, in the, in, especially in England and the United States, where we're all English chauvinists, um, nobody reads a foreign language. This meant that uh, Mises' book, not having been translated until, until the mid-30s, in other words, it took almost 25 years for somebody to translate this theory of money and credit into English. Nobody, nobody read Mises, and nobody then has never got absorbed into the English-speaking world. It got absorbed into the continent, into Austria particularly. And um, actually, uh, so and it was translated really too late. By the time it was translated, Keynes comes along. The whole thing gets swept aside. I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, So this, this problem of translation becomes, became a, a, a key point in the transmission of ideas. Um, as a matter of fact, one interesting thing was, as an aside about the great Keynes, Keynes reviewed the book for the Economic Journal, which was the great prestigious journal in England, Economic Journal in England, still is. So Keynes reviewed the theory of money and credit, he says, well, it's an interesting book, but it hasn't, hasn't got anything new to say, it's sort of an interesting textbook on money. It turns out later on, Keynes admitted, I think his, his biographer admitted it, that Keynes didn't know German. This book was, for, he reviewed the, the German book, right? <laughs> and, or, or to put it this way, he knew enough German to, to understand something which he already knew. But he couldn't understand, he didn't know it enough to understand a new idea, okay? So here this, here this SOB says, there's nothing new in this. <laughs> so anyway, this, uh, as a result, Misesianism, so to speak, didn't get, didn't penetrate to the English-speaking world until it was really too late. Um, 
finally, what happened was that, um, uh, well, first of all, Mises is one of the few people in the 1920s to forecast the Great Depression. So this is not a, the orthodox position then was, well, it's a new era, as the Republican administration called it here in the 20s. We have a new era because we have a Fed now. This was the, this was the orthodox line, and the mainstream line. We have a Federal Reserve System, and they, could, they can correct everything. They can pump money in if they see prices are falling. They pump money into the system. If they see prices going up, they take money out. They can fine-tune the economy so they can iron out the business cycle. And it was the pre-Friedmanites, by the way, who were saying this. Irving Fisher, sort of the, the, the pre-Friedmanite, uh, was the big guru economist in the 1920s. He's sort of equivalent to Samuelson or Galbraith now, I guess. And... Uh, and his position was, this is great, we've now ironed out the whole business cycle because we have a Fed. Yeah. Um, and um, so when, they, when the stock market crash came and the 1929 depression came, these, first of all, he, Fisher wrote a book in 1930 okay, saying everything is great, everything's in great shape, there is no depression, there's no crash, it's just a slight blip in the, in the new era. <laughs> and because the theory was if, price, if you look at the wholesale price level, and it's not going up, it means there's no inflation. Of course, Mises had said just the opposite. You don't look at the wholesale price level. You look at money supply and at credit because prices should be falling. In a free market capitalism, prices tend to fall. Uh, as, as, for example, computers and, pe and, and penicillin and TV sets have fallen dramatically. So what usually happens under free market capitalism is prices tend to fall. And if prices are not falling, there's something wrong. In other words, the, the, the Fed or the central bank is pumping in too much money. <clears throat> this will create a business cycle. And of course, he turned out to be right. So he was predicting this sort of phenomenon. As a result, um, his views became very popular in, in, in Europe uh, after the Great Depression, came, after 1929. It then happened that his major student, Hayek, um, went, went to the London School of Economics. Lionel Robbins was a big shot at the London School, had studied under Mises in Vienna, had absorbed a lot of Misesian thought, and brought Hayek over. And Hayek then brings the message of Austrian business cycle theory, and he's essay business cycle theory to England. At one point, he had converted all the top young economists in England, all the guys who are now, later became big shot Keynesians. And um, so it looked very much as if uh, Misesian theory would then penetrate to the United States and take over the English profession. What then happened was the Keynesian revolution, which comes out and just swept the board, like, you know, it was like a revelation from off high. Uh, all these people converted back to Keynesianism, who knew better, by the way. They were following the zeitgeist. Uh, that was they had their finger to the wind. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, but it's kind of interesting about the way the Keynes took over. It's not that the Keynesians refuted the previous people. You know, when you read in the textbook about how science develops, you read that, well, uh, you, everybody patiently tests their hypotheses, and they, then they confirm them, refute them, and new hypotheses come in. This is all baloney. It almost never happens, especially in the social sciences. <laughs> and uh, what happens is, is a, it's like a fashion comes in, a, a wave, a new wave of the future comes in. And, uh, and suddenly everybody dropped Austrian theory and, and shifted to Keynesianism. And um, there are various explanations for this. Uh, one is intellectuals were looking for a big state, big growth in statism, and this is the way to do it. And two, of course, the governments love the idea that deficits are great. Governments always love it. <laughs> Right now, whichever party is in power loves deficits. Okay, the only people against deficits are those who are out of power. <laughs> so, uh, so the government, the governments took the Keynesianism like a duck takes the water. This is great. We finally have an economist who's in favor of, of big, big spending, uh, public works and deficit spending. Because before Keynes, most economists, regardless of whether they were right wing, left wing, whatever, were against the deficits. And so suddenly, this guy comes along as a very distinguished economist and says, "No, no, this is the wave of the future. Deficits are great." So, uh, at any rate, so this, this kills Misesian theory in, in, in England. So by the, t by the late 30s, it's all forgotten, just sort of swept under the rug. And, uh, and of course, with the rise of uh, Nazism and the war, it's, it's, it's more or less gone, at least temporarily, in Europe. Anyway, while this was going on, while Mises was developing a, a business, uh, integrating you know, microeconomics with money and developing a business cycle theory, uh, he was also doing something else. I mean, they're doing many other things at the same time. Socialism was coming in uh, after World War I, as a result of World War I. Socialism began to sweep Europe. And Mises came out with this famous article in 1920 showing the, the real problem of socialism is not the usual problem, who will sweep the streets and who will take the garbage out, which is, you know, which is a problem. But the real problem is that socialism can't calculate. They wouldn't know what the hell to do. The Central Planning Board wouldn't know what to produce where. 
and where to st set up a steel plant should it be in Novosibirsk or in Omsk or whatever. There was no, there's no rational guideline to plan, therefore the whole thing is, you know, just, would just be a total failure. And Mises started a great debate in the socialist, uh, socialist thought about whether or not governments or central socialism can calculate. Um, the, uh, they sort of accept it now. I mean, after many years, when I was going to college and graduate school, the theory was Mises has been refuted because Oscar Longa, the great Polish uh, Marxist, uh, had shown that if you had perfect conditions or whatever, the government could act as if they were the market. And sort of you tell your managers, be the market, be market. And then they go out and, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and Mises, of course, showed that it wouldn't work either. And in practice, of course, it hasn't worked. And uh, there was one interesting phenomenon where uh, one thing that Mises said is that the only reason why socialism works at all right now is because there's a world market out there where they can refer to the prices. It doesn't work very, you know, it works very badly, but at least there's a world market they can say, okay, the price of steel is such and such or cement or whatever. And uh, a noted English economist visited Poland this is in the 50s. He asked the Polish economist, that's at the time when central planning was, was had hit its stride, and the, the Polish communist economist admitted that they, they refer to the world market. That's how they can do anything. And so he, so, this economist said, well, look, uh, if socialism takes over the whole world, which you're presumably in favor of, what, will you, what would you do then? Well, there is no market left. They said, well, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. They <laughs> <laughs> got a great answer. But anyway, so, so Mises showed in the early 1920s that socialism, socialism can't calculate. And that's what converted Hayek, by the way. Hayek had been a socialist before that. Read the book, and, that was, and he was converted to, to free market. And... Uh, and then uh, he showed that interventionism doesn't work either, because interventionism, for example, is a cumulative effect. Price controls don't work. Taxes cripple savings and investment, et cetera. And each, each intervention causes, sets the conditions up for another intervention to try to cure that. And that doesn't cure that, but creates conditions for more intervention, et cetera, et cetera, until you wind up with socialism, which doesn't work either. So what we had then was a, um, a as a result of all this, a carefully built, constructed case for uh, why the market works and why government doesn't work. In the meantime, he, was, he also had a methodological fight. Uh, Mises was essentially the one who invent, well, invented the concept of praxeology. Actually, the Austrians have been doing that before, but he pointed out what the, what the method is. It's deducing, making deductions from self-evident axioms, or axioms which people would read to as soon as they understand it. And he had a big methodological battle with other people, with positivism, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, he developed, he, after setting the agenda for methodology for how economics should be constructed, he finally did it with human action. In other words, he just, okay, here's your, first he says, here's your, how you can do it, and then he finally does it. Uh, where human action presents the whole doctrine, the whole thing, how, how the market works in intricate detail, and why government screws things up. So this is a fantastic achievement. It's just an unbelievable achievement. I think, uh, I think, I don't sling around words like the greatest, like some people do. I think Mises is certainly one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, I and mean, there's no question about it. Um, the, um, okay, while he was doing all this, while he was doing this fantastic scholarly and theoretical achievement, he was also battling on the activist front, and, and political activists. I already mentioned how he was a, adv sending advice to the, to the Austrian government to help stop the inflation. Um, and, uh, he also constantly battled for laissez-faire, pure laissez-faire system. Now, of course, during the, during the 30s in particular, this was getting more and more out of fashion, to say the least. But nothing ever stopped them. It was just, it was just amazing. I mean, uh, fiery, intransigent, uncompromising. And the more the, the climate became socialistic and status, the more he battled openly and frankly for laissez-faire. I remember when I was uh, getting interested in economics in, in the 1940s, and friends of mine who later did the same thing, same thing happened to them, we tried to find one economist who said it openly he was in favor of laissez-faire, and we couldn't find it. There were all sorts of conservative economists then. And they would say, yes, yes, the government shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. And there's always a chapter, either the last or the first chapter, where he says, of course, I'm not in favor of laissez-faire. That's reactionary garbage. Uh, <laughs> government has to plan, blah, 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 blah. And then we say, ah, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Can't we find one economist who says openly he's in favor of laissez-faire? And of course, Mises was it, and still, yeah, almost, almost still is uh, it. <laughs> The only one who says, frankly, he's in favor of laissez-faire, all the way, no, no compromise, and just and spells it out <clears throat> and battles for it. Uh, Mrs. Mises, uh, is a remarkable woman, woman in her own right, who we just had a dinner, a tribute dinner for her, uh, and uh, she, she gave her speech, even though she's frail and ill health, she gave a rousing talk, 
and she said that Mises was a, was, the act, was an activist of the mind, and she stressed the fact that she attacked she attacked the uh, Austrians who want to divorce themselves from the real world and to only talk about pure theory and never talk about po political questions. She said that's not what my husband's views are. My husband's you know was an activist, and um, in addition to all that, his, uh, especially in his earlier work when he dealt with questions of imperialism, for example. Mises was a flaming anti-imperialist, and uh, I recommend his writings as liberalism and uh, nation-state and market um, on that. He, he got to one point where he said each individual has, well, first he said every, every group has a right to see seed from a state apparatus they don't like. If they want to get out, they should have a right to get out. In Europe, of course, there's a, there's a big question. Should the Serbs rule the Croats, for example? In Europe, there are hundreds of nationalities, ethnic groups, each of whom hate each other's guts, and usually with good reason. <laughs> so uh, many of them want to get out, form their own country, etc. And they, he said, yes, they should be allowed to do it. In one discussion, he said, well, each, every town should have a right, every village should have the right to see seed if they want to. And he almost got to the point of anarchism when he said, each individual should have the right to see seed. Then he stopped, he said, well, of course, that would be impractical. And that was the end, end of the discussion. But it was, a, it was a fascinating discussion of that. He also bitterly attacked imperialism. I want to read this to you, one quote from him, because this stuff is sort of, nobody talks about this anymore. Uh, none of his modern followers. A uh, quote from Mises, no chapter in history is steeped further in blood than the history of colonialism. Flourishing lands were laid waste, whole peoples destroyed and exterminated. All this can in no way be extenuated or justified. The dominion of Europe, of Europeans in Africa and important parts of Asia is absolute. It stands in the sharpest contrast to all the principles of liberalism and democracy, and there can be no doubt that we must strive for its abolition. This was written about 1919, 1920s. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> okay, the Mises is a person. Um, as I say, he's intransigent, uncompromising, etc. He was, he was sweet and charming in, in person. It was very interesting because well, those, those of us who, who were going to meet Mises, either you know, studying in a seminar or any other circumstance, we're usually quaking in our boots. Here's this guy's lashing out at all the enemies, all the bad guys. And we figure this guy's a fiery monster, you know, great, great, on the great side, but, you know, uh, uh, lashing out constantly. He was a sweetie pie. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he was always trying to encourage, charming and courteous, always trying to encourage students to do research, throwing out research projects, uh, even students who are obviously clunks who would never do any research. He was always trying to encourage them in doing this. And one great statement, which I've written about, but I think deserves mentioning here, in order to put people at their ease in the seminar, I mean, these people didn't know anything. Most of us didn't know anything. And here's this great man, you know, with a tremendous amount of knowledge and erudition. He said, look, he wanted to stimulate questions or comments. He said, look, don't be afraid to say anything, because whatever you say, regardless of how idiotic it is, some eminent economist has already said it. <laughs> <laughs> Marvelous, I love it. <laughs> and uh, of course, he was right. I mean, not only was this funny, he was also correct. <laughs> and um, he's always trying to encourage us to, uh, you know, to speak up and, and say what we, what we, uh, what our position was on things, etc. Uh, he's also full of, I'd say, great anecdotes. Um, there's one charming one I, I remember. This, which those of you who are philosophically inclined, be particularly appreciate. He was walking along the streets of Vienna. Of course, in Vienna, everybody walks all the time. It's a great city to walk in. Even I walk in Vienna. Which I, I usually don't walk. I usually take a cab two blocks, being an inveterate New Yorker. At any rate, uh, and uh, he was walking with Max Scheler, who was a distinguished philosopher from Germany, and, he, and they were attacking logical positivism, which was coming in there as the big new thing. And um, the, uh, which then, of course, took over the philosophic profession and ruled it with an iron hand for about 30 years. It's only the, its iron grip is only now beginning to fade, and uh, and Scheler finally, who comes from Berlin, finally said, "Well, look, Ludwig, Lou, uh, what is there on the climate of Vienna? What is there on this place? The climate of this place that breeds all these damn logical positivists?" And Mises gave it, I think, a typical reply from Mises. He says, shrugs his shoulders, said, "Well, look, look, Max, uh, in Vienna there are now two million people, let's say, and of the two million, about twelve logical positivists. So it can't be the climate <laughs> creates them." <laughs> So this is uh, this is typical Misesian <laughs> wit, and um, another great story I'll tell you uh, about Mises. Another great anecdote: He was uh, after World War One. Uh, there was a communist regime in Hungary for a couple for uh, about six months, six very bloody months, the Bela Kun regime, 
And he was, Mises was representing Austria in a, a, a trade treaty with communist Hungary. And uh, Karl Polanyi, the famous left-wing uh, sociologist, I guess you call him, and uh, was, the, was the representative from Hungary. And so Mises said he and Polanyi used to walk around, walk around Vienna and talk about trade and something. Both of them realized, of course, the Bela Kun regime would fold in a few months. And the whole idea of, of, of Polanyi was to prolong the negotiations so he could stay in Vienna and you know, <laughs> get the hell out. <laughs> so, so they had a fine time just sort of, you know, just BSing <laughs> in general until the Kun regime dissolved and uh, Polanyi was safe. So uh, <laughs> such is the, the history of diplomacy. <laughs> At any rate, when Mises got to, uh, he was driven, he was, of course, uh, driven out of uh, Austria. He was, uh, his library was burned by the Nazis. He, uh, and when, when, the, when Hitler, Hitler began to take over Western Europe, uh, he fled through, through the Spanish route uh, to the United States. He came here without a penny. And um, uh, at that time, uh, during and after World War II, uh, every, every communist, Marxist, semi-Marxist, Leninist, and whatever, re a refugee, was immediately awarded with great academic posts. Full professor at Harvard, you know, step in, so-and-so. Uh, and uh, Mises couldn't find any academic post. Uh, he never found a paid academic post in his life, in the United States in particular. And um, finally, he had a, they had to settle for uh, a consortium of businessmen. Well, it started with Leonard Reed of the Foundation for Economic Education, and a consortium of businessmen paying for a salary at NYU. So he was always a visiting professor. He visited there for about 20 years. <laughs> and uh, never got it paid by NYU. And not only that, but NYU was very nasty about, about him because the dean kept telling people, don't take this guy's courses. He's you know, reactionary, you know, crazy, or whatever. And so. Here he was, totally scorned by the establishment, um, to say the least. Uh, in those days, you have to realize the, the intellectual climate in the United States. This is during and after World War II. Uh, I, was on a Colum I was in Columbia Graduate School then. There was a hordes of people on the, uh, in graduate school, N enormous. Everybody's on the GI Bill. And they're all a fire with a new world a coming. So, and the big argument on campus was, should you be a, a Communist Party member or not? That was the big moral problem, say. And uh, those who were not Communist Party members were left-wing socialists. So the, those are the debate on campus, you see. And in that climate, uh, Mises was, was totally ignored, you know, almost obliterated. Uh, and uh, his name never came up, except to say, in, in gra graduate school, for example, well, Mises thought that socialism can't calculate. We've now proven it can. That was sort of, that's it. That's all he did, and it sort of takes care of that. Uh, fortunately, I met Mises through fee. and. Uh, and they told me the fee. Well, Mises is starting a seminar in, and at uh, NYU, and uh, and his book is he's coming out with a new book. So I said, "What's in the book?" And I said, "Everything." That's the human human action. Of course, they were right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then he started. And the thing is, even though he here he was, he was totally you know, obviously depressed about the world situation, um, and scorned by everybody, ignored, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Always very cheerful, uh, never bitter. It was just uh, just amazing, just magnificent. And, uh, and so he took, a, took the whole thing in, in good spirits. Even though in his, in, his, uh, in, his note, in his autobiography, which is called Notes and Recollections, written in 1940 at the, in despair while he was fleeing uh, Europe, he wrote and he said uh, he, uh, he never thought, he, he thought he'd be, I don't know, advocating uh, reforms or whatever. And he, didn't, he didn't realize he was going to be an historian of the decline of civilization. So by, he was, as I say, always very cheery and uh, and uh, never upset. I mean, just just a magnificent, uh, just, just magnificent. He was a great role model as well as everything else, a personal role model for everybody. Uh, when he died, uh, Ralph Rako, his former student, uh, mentioned to me that uh, the, great, the great quote from Shelley's uh, uh, from Shelley's uh, Adonais, the Elegy on the Death of Keats. And I just want to read this, read you this one. Stanza, and I think it applies to Mises beautifully. And he is gathered to the kings of thought, who wage contention with their time's decay, and of the past are all that cannot pass away. So I think, um, and I, I think it's a wonderful tribute, and I think it uh, say applies to Mises. Just one more thing, one more statement about Mises. He's universally beloved in the, in the what we can call the free market movement loosely. Uh, and uh, his very name resonates with affection. Uh, one interesting one interesting example of that this was some years ago. I was at a dinner party for friends, about eight or ten people. It was a, a whole spectrum of what could be called the right wing, I guess, in those days. Uh, 
libertarians, rationalists, right-wing Catholics, etc., etc. And they, one guy decided, the, the host, I guess, decided, well, we, have to, we should toast somebody before we start dinner. And uh, so somebody suggested Burke, and uh, rational, also rationalists said nuts to that. Somebody said Payne, and the, the traditionalists said fooey on pain. We couldn't think of anybody to toast. And there was a great danger that they're getting cold. <laughs> no food. And uh, as you probably can guess, I'm pretty serious about the food question. <laughs> so, so finally, somebody said, to Ludwig von Mises. And he said, of course. And unanimous enthusiasm, and we toasted the Mises. I, I give you that toast right now. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments? I think we have a few minutes for that. Nobody? No anti Mesesians here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you explain Was there any relationship between von Mises and Ayn Rand? There was. Uh, it's, it's kind of intricate. Um, they knew each other, and of course, Rand recommended Mises' books. Uh, and uh, although she always said that human act, don't read the first half of human action because it's philosophically unsound. <laughs> uh, and um, so they knew each other. They didn't, they didn't get along too well, as you might expect. Two strong-minded personalities at work. Uh, so, but they had sort of a distant relationship, I would, I would say. I think it's the best way to describe it. And uh, there was, I think they respected each other in their various spheres. I mean, he liked Atlas Shrugged as a novel. So it was, a good way to spread the message, etc. And, and uh, so I think that's, I think that's about it. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty. It was pretty uh, rigor, r rugged. <laughs> so they didn't like each other too much at all. As a matter of fact, another great story: uh, the founding of the Mont Pelerin Society, which was um, the it's now a, a huge swollen society of everybody to the right of Galbraith. I would say. <laughs> But it, it, it started out with about a dozen people of free market economists, basically, and, 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 and scholars. And Mises and Friedman were at the founding, and Hayek and Rupke and people like that were the founding uh, convent, uh, conference of the Mont Pelerin Society. It was called Mont Pelerin Society because it was held up on the mountaintop at Mont Pelerin in Switzerland. And anyway, uh, apparently there's one great story. I've heard different, about four or five different versions of what actually happened there. So, you know, it's a little, but... Uh, um, Mises was aghast at the social philosophy being spread there because, I mean, Friedman, for example, was in favor of, 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 of a negative income tax. In those days, a progressive income tax to boot. And um, many of the other people there were, were also. And finally, at one point, I think it was on the tax question, I think it was the idea of progressive income tax, Mises got, got sore and flung his pencil down on the table and said, you're all a bunch of socialists, and walked out. And uh, Friedman t likes to tell his story as an attack on Mises and uh, showing what a extreme doctrinaire dogmatist he was. I, I blotted my own copy book with Friedman many years ago, and he told this story at an Austrian economics conference, by the way. He was invited to be the keynote speaker for some reason which I could never fathom, Friedman. And uh, since he's very, very much very strongly opposed to it. Anyway, he told the story about, about how terrible dogmatic uh, Mises was. And when he said, you're all much a socialist, I applauded. Of course, uh, Freeman then denounced me from the pulpit. He <laughs> 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 was being typical of sort of person he hated and that sort of stuff. And our relations have not been very warm since then. <laughs> so they did not like get along very well at all. That's, I think, the, uh, the upshot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Murray, I'm a, uh, No, no, I'm never mentioned, of course. No, <laughs> no there is a little, there's a little bit. Yeah, there's a little bit. No, there's a little bit now. I mean, Samuelson, whose textbook is not no longer the best selling, but still probably the most famous one, uh, mentions Hayek. I think he might mention it, Mises even. First of all, he mentions, uh, mentions them in the socialist calculation debate. Because uh, now they're beginning to realize that maybe socialism really can't calculate after the flops, flopperoos of the East, Eastern Europe, etc. Um, and also, I think Hay uh, Samuelson mentions Hayek on capital theory. So it's, it's not quite that bleak. It's a little bit popping up here and there. As a matter of fact, current textbooks now mention libertarianism, by the way. 
Uh, there's now, it's great because there's usually a, a section called radical economics. Okay? And <laughs> that's, the, that's the new shtick. And uh, there's a, most of it, of course, on Marxism and left wing Marxism, right wing Marxism. And there's always, there's usually a paragraph or two on libertarians, being the, the opposite pole. And Rothenbrenner, by the way, his latest textbook, who was very smart, I mean, he's not, he's not a, no sense of free market person, but he has a pretty good chap section on libertarianism and uh, distinguishes between that and objectivism and so forth. I mean, it's pretty good for somebody from, a, from an outlander. It's pretty damn good. So, I mean, it's beginning to pop in now. Uh, it's not, not in great shape. And some of the textbooks, Bayard and, and uh, Leahy have intermediate price theory or, or macro and micro textbooks. They're now sort of semi-Austrians. They slip it in a little bit. So you can't have an Austrian textbook because no, 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 no college would, would use it. So what they do is they slip it in. They slip in like at the end of the usual baloney. They say, on the other hand, Hayek uh, points out this really doesn't work, etc. So <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> so it's beginning, to, it's beginning to sneak in. And as somebody as somebody said once, uh, once an idea gets in, incorporated in a textbook, it's there forever. You can never blast it out. So uh, it's not. Yeah, it's, it, it, you're 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 mostly right, but there's, there's hope. I think. I mean, the last few years, I think, has been a slight shift. The beginning of the thing now is that we're, we're respectable. We're another group. Also, they use us as a token against the Marxists. So that every, I, you, know, you get to a point where a department really is in favor of academic freedom, which is quite rare, by the way, despite all the, uh, the, the noise. Uh, we'll have one Marxist and one Austrian or one free market person. So to show they're really you know, sort of balanced. In the old days, they only had one Marxist. That was the balance. So you know, it's, things, are, things are improving <laughs> on the academic front. Yeah. Let's say you're a high school senior who's thinking about studying economics oh. in college. Oh. Uh, is it, and let's say uh, that generally uh, you're of your school, the Rothbard School, would it be preferable to uh, go to a college where they teach Austrian economics so you can learn what's mm. right, or maybe uh, would it be preferable to go to a standard school so in effect you're learning what everybody else thinks? Yeah, that's a tough question, it really is, because it's usually a question, do you want the prestige that goes along with a Harvard or Yale, whatever degree, or you, know, you want to get the true stuff from, from a non-prestigious school. And there are arguments either way. You know, it really depends on one's temperament, I think. Um, I mean, I, I, think it's, I frankly think it's better to go to a prestigious school and suffer through all the, all the stuff and know what the other guys are saying than go to a school which has no, no, no reputation. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's done both ways. One of the problems with, with a going to Harvard or Yale, etc., as, as, the, as the kids begin to get brainwashed in the wrong direction, they begin to lose part of the cadre, so to speak. Uh, but that's, I, I, I know, I would, I would pick the prestigious school myself because one of the main reasons you go to college is to get the prestige. I mean, you know, learning is only a minor, a minor element. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, everybody has to answer that for themselves, really. I think that's the, the point. <laughs> Actually, the college situation is not that bad. We now have there are now a lot of colleges which have at least one Austrian, let's say. Uh, the problem is really graduate school, where the, where, the, where the establishment really locks in, because that's where you train future economists. And that's much more difficult to crack, the graduate school question. We do, we, we're beginning to crack that now, too. There are now places in graduate school you can actually learn Austrian economics, but it's a, that's a tough road to hoe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Government intervention is responsible for all business cycles, or might might a totally free market also have cycles? Well, I don't. I think there'd be fluctuation. There wouldn't be any cycles, and there wouldn't be the, the traditional boom bust, malinvestment, uh, unemployment, all that sort of stuff cycle. I, I don't. I think that's the government. There'd be fluctuation. I mean, for example, there'd be a seven year. Lo let's say let's say you have a country which is plagued every seven years by locusts. Okay, and every seven years everybody gears up because they know that you know the locust is coming in 1988. And so you'd have fluctuations. In other words, the locust fighting industry would start gearing up a year or two before that. And after the locust comes, they sort of disappear. And that's a cycle. And there's, and there's no problem with it because everybody adjusts ahead of time. So there would be fluctuation. There'd be fluctuation in individual industries, obviously. I mean, uh, the firms, you know, they, which there is all the time, the firms which still make adding machines. When I was going to graduate school, for example, they used calculating, what was called calculating machines, big, funky, you know, 500 pound things, which bang away, you get a multiplication in about three minutes, okay? <laughs> now, the people, those firms have stuck to that and didn't shift the you know, calculators or whatever, computers, have gone out of business. In other words, there'd be fluctuations within the market, obviously, as new things come up, old things become obsolescent. But there wouldn't be any real cycle, there wouldn't be massive unemployment, any large scale, things like that, or massive bankruptcies. Uh, 
uh, spreading throughout the, you know, the system. Yeah. How would you explain to the misinformed how abolishing the Federal Reserve would be in their best interest and how the money and credit system would work? Well, it's difficult to explain how the money and credit system would work. I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's easier to explain how, how the, why, it's, why it's wrecks the, the system. I mean, you, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's that difficult. You point out the Federal Reserve uh, prints money. Okay, they're, they're, they're legalized money counterfeiters. They're legalized counterfeiters. If I print money, I go to jail for a long time, by the way. I mean, none, nobody worries about my, the, my upbringing, my, the private playgrounds as a youth that came from broken home. None, none of that stuff applies to counterfeiters. <laughs> <laughs> counterfeiters, they crack down on. They zero in. They find them, they catch them, and they suck them away for 30 years. Those counterfeiters do something serious. Anyway, they're interfering with the government's monopoly of counterfeiting. <laughs> So uh, I think that's not. I don't. I think it's fairly, fairly easy to point out. It's difficult to explain exactly how the Fed does it. That's a very technical thing. But it's just to say, well, they counterfeit, and that's what they do. You know, and that causes inflation and distortions in production. And the reason why there's a chronic inflation because now the Fed can counterfeit without, at will. In the old days, they couldn't. You know, so I think that's pretty simple. There's also there's, a, there's a, an interesting backlog of anti-Fed sentiment in the United States. Not you know, there's a whole. There's a whole subculture of people who hate the Fed, usually for pretty good reasons. So that's you know, so that starts off with a good climate of opinion. <laughs> yeah. Any? Anybody else? Huh? Yeah. I can't see. Okay, over there, corner. The problem there is, doesn't any private banking system that has fractional reserve banking, which is almost the bank is going to operate for profit, has to have. Most likely it's going to play the fractional reserve game. Unless there are some industry-wide or some sort of some sort of standards set by some association, doesn't that cause everybody playing a different fractional reserve ratio mm. cause an inherent inability of the system and has to require some sort of standardization by some association, be it a private, just like the you know, best reviews and yeah. companies. But I mean if the system we had before the Fed though still had regional booms and busts. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> well, that's a very complex question. The, the Fed, before the Fed, we had a quasi-centralized system. It had a national banking system. So the only really approximation of freedom of banking was before the Civil War, between 1833 or whatever, the, one of the exact date when the Bank of the United States was finally smashed, until the Civil War. Um, and there were problems with that. It wasn't really, really free. Uh, a lot of regulations and stuff. Um, I, I, uh, the... Uh, I, first of all, I, I think banks can easily survive 100% reserve. Now they have the money market funds and things like that. I mean, these are great new instruments, certificate of deposits, CDs, and money market funds where the banks can, you know, was, you, lend, you lend the bank money for a certain specific length of time, say six months or whatever, and you know it and they know it, and there's no fraudulent aspect involved. That's great. You don't need any reserves at all for that. All you have to know is in six months you should get the money ready, you know, and the thing fools do. Uh, and the fractional reserve, I, I personally, am a, I, I consider this is a big argument within the Austrian camp, still raging. I personally think fractional reserve banking is fraud. Okay, I'm, others of my colleagues think it isn't. But I, I think in the free market, it would really, it would really either disappear or be of minor importance because the hard money banks could always call upon the other, the, the, the crummy banks for redemption. Okay, here's we we collecting your bills, pay up. This will put them out of business pretty fast. Uh, in the pre-Civil War period, there were such, there were people called money brokers who would collect the notes, say, of the Bank of Oshkosh, who were printing, printing money like mad, uh, promising to pay in gold or silver. Of course, they didn't have anything. And the money brokers would, would you know, collect all the stuff in the East, let's say, schlep over to Oshkosh and present the, uh, you know, $50,000 bills. If they weren't shot by the local Jean Marie, which is <laughs> often happened <laughs> in the pay of the banks, they, the banks would go under. And then now, of course, it's much easier to do that. You have electronic transfers, etc. You don't have to have some guy in a horse <laughs> riding three days to get to the bank. <laughs> so nowadays, it'd be much easier to, to, to bust them. And my own solution to the problem is, as a 100% reserve person as well, if you, don't have, if you just have free banking, there'd be anti-bank vigilante leagues, leads, which would make sure you're know, propagandized on the TV. That bank is bankrupt. Go get your money out fast. This would, this would be enough to kill it. <laughs> well, we could go on all morning happily, but then we would have to go on all afternoon oh, and evening to get our other business done. Right. So I want to say thank you, thank Murray. Thank you, Tony. Pleasure. Thank you very much.